Um, thank you all for coming out. Thank you, Char, Drew, Sundog, Woodstock. Thank you to the heat for backing off by about 20 degrees. Uh, it's probably a lot nicer here than it than yesterday. I'm going to read largely um, from my last book, Ten of the River. I grew up in uh, Lowell, Massachusetts, in the Merrimack Valley. You know, Kerouac's from there. Frost grew up in Lawrence. Um, Hundred views is from there, and um, it's sort of the Merrimack Valley runs through New Hampshire, down to Massachusetts, pours out into Plum Island, and I was trying to capture a little bit of that area. Um, it's a sort of microcosm of the country, and the first poem I'm going to read from is sort of an associative poem that I like to kick off with. Um, I was reading a Cabay Akbar poem years ago, and it just this kind of poem just poured out of me. It's called Autobiography. For a moment. I was a failed skip of stone sunk into the river. For a moment, I was the river, purling in long last shadows of September. For a moment, I was a skinny grizzly spitting into a beer can. For a time, I was Christmas lights wrapping around downtown smokestack until I became a book filled with baby teeth. For a while, I was a boy painting the portrait of a queen. For a while, I was a child queen. For a while, I knew the switches to every light, knew the angles of every kiss in the autumn night and shaped mourning from the curve of her hips. For a while I spelled the difference between church and lips. For a while I was young, for a while I was son. For a while I was father of a million reasons not to pray. For a while God begged me for apology. For a while I was an apology, walking the edge of the dam. For a while I was dust on the floor of a cotton mill, swept by a broom out into summer. For a while I was summer until liver-spotted clouds blew over the dunes to fling the monarchs into Mexico. For a while, I was oil mill, fir, and yucca tree. After all, sap ran desert west after sugar maple, elm, and pine. For a moment I, there, I had made up my mind to be worm for the plover. For a second, I believed I was enough vessel for my children. For a night, my wife was able to rest on our blade of stars. For one moon, the sea could trade us. For the sun, for one dawn, we filched the horizon. I'm not really sure what's going on there. It just sounds nice. Um, <laughs> so the, the, the poem really, kick, the book kicks off with this, um, it's a whole story of the river, and this is poet works his, the, the artist sort of works his way through this town. In the beginning of the book, he starts with asking the river um, for inspiration. It goes back to the river of his youth, in this case, the Merrimack River, which means strong place in the Abenaki language, or gathering place sometimes. Um, and asked for inspiration. Later on in the book, the river says no in several different voices because we've already, the river's already given us enough. But this is the invocation at the Merrimack. I guess Ikwe is a Penacook uh, bride or queen. That's one word to know. Invocation at the Merrimack. And now I take a tongue into your mud, into your syringe and soda bottle banks to beg your braided silk, your Penacook Ikwe, your sliding tar of snake, your mouth of stones, your clavicle of royal and moan. Your lover ghost thrown from Pawtucket Falls, your whitewater of bread and roses, your creak of locks and lifts, your leap from burning windows. Your fished out crib of salmon and shiv, of shell casings and shad, alewife and boosted tires. Your cradle of flywheel, a factory, your mill girl offering, your doffers, your biddies, your boom and your busted. Penitent palm, I stand in this, your sun tussling dawn to call a song. My river, roll your blue-black hips under the oxidized iron of cantilever and cable. Deluge and slip bridge ribs and sing between the red brick and brackish heft of textile mills turned art galleries with crack alleys. You bender of flashboard pins, come, sing to me, sluice me. Double back and seduce me to your flood, tender me down to your Irish blood canals, your Greek restaurant ghettos, fluorescent Cambodian groceries, chunk killed Brazilian bakeries. Your cobblestones expel to some, expose to sell some roomy history. Bones old and broken of flesh and sack and ash, I call a song. You ferried me home. Now drink and spit me out where City Hall has crouched inside downtown's diverticula. Down to the fountain at JFK Plaza where my brother was suckered by a kid I wouldn't hit back, and there, just one of 10 police stations, pulled the library and across our Ave, Lowell High, its field house named after our grandfather. The calm Masonic temple, the bring your own wine via tie, and bars, and bars, and bars. 
one for every St. Anne's Immaculate in St. Patrick's. In your hydraulic draw, prayers are tossed like toast of tilted pints. There, here, my palms unfold. Give willow to me against my flooded nights, against my broken rights. So you flow down and roll stones, old river, and mourn me here for what I am and not. Wake my song and pluck me to your pulse. I'll stay down in your valley, drink your ink of water, and dream myself back into you. Make me small again. Roll me in your lap, your mud, your moonlit blood. Suffocated by the greasy vents of a train car diner, I beg your lip of water to whisper. Um, so about 12, maybe 13 years ago, I don't know if you guys remember this movie, The Fighter, that came out with Mark Wahlberg and Christian Bale. Christian Bale won an Oscar for playing this crackhead named Dickie, who was brothers to um, Mickey Ward, who was this really great um, professional lightweight fighter, a welterweight fighter. And the town, you know, they filmed the movie in our town because he's from our town. It was great, and Hollywood came for us and for Hero, and everyone loved it. And then one of my friends who I played football with back in high school, he, he was a cop in town. He got to play his father. Uh, who was a cop 25 years before and was responsible for one of the guys who broke Mickey Ward's, the boxer's hand when he got into a fight with him. So, and then but one night, uh, my, this guy I grew up with, he, was, he struggled, as a police officers often do, with um, addiction issues, and um, he uh, ran into somebody one night coming home from a bar and killed that person. And I wrote this poem, not so he wouldn't, you know, not to, to excuse him for what he did, but not to be that the only story that, that makes his life. You know, that is not the only thing he was. And that none of us should be defined by our worst or saddest moments. And so I don't name him in this poem. I do name the person killed because that person needed a reckoning. Uh, but this poem is called Real Life. In The Fighter, Wahlberg, Wahlberg plays a welterweight from Lowell named Mickey Ward. And Mickey, one night, sticking up for his crackhead, half-brother Dickie, played by Christian Bale, gets his right hand busted by the cops, just like in real life. In the film, one of the cops is played by the real-life son of one of the cops, and he was, for his time, a cop in Lowell. I played football with him in high school. I can still see him all alone in the end zone after our tunnel vision QB threw it to me again on a tight end drag for a short yard gain. It's great to see him play his dad, though I heard there were issues between them, and then to see him grin into the camera during those closing credit shots of the town and people. Hollywood had come to us to find a hero. And though I never met Mickey, I saw him once at the gym. A few years later, well after the cameras tied it out of town, after Bale had made his Oscar speech, Dickie got popped again for stealing and dealing, and the cop I played ball with drove home one night so ripped he never saw the SUV as he veered across Route 110 in Methuen. A man named Bryant Paula died instantly. The cop, the boy I knew, was arrested. He wept in court, asked to be punished, and went to jail. And none of this has anything to do with the movies, except that maybe everything has to do with the movies. As we run alone into an October end zone, arms flailing, hoping someone will see that we are more than our falling action, more than this soft light flickering against the dark. So the, a number of these poems are about lost boys, boys lost along the way in my town and the area that I grew up in. And I was, this one's a little hard to explain with this poem. Um, I was playing this game Dungeons Dragons, some of you might know with my son. And there's a thing in Dungeons Dragons, you roll a 20-sided dice to see if you survive like dragon fire or like spells and things like that. Um, and that, that dice roll can be adjusted depending if you have magic armor or if you have cursed armor or magic sword and stuff. So, that was in my head, and I had read this Robin Costa poem um, called Math about the chances of a um, black boy surviving past the age of 18, and that put this poem idea, this poem in my head. Because um, I was thinking about my son and who he was and wanted to be, and son and all the boys. So I wrote this poem called Saving Throw, and that's what it's called in this, this thing in Dungeons and Dragons, anyway. Saving Throw. Take a boy, my boy. Understand mortality rates have been falling for decades. Understand there is no safer time to be alive, to be a boy, white boy, blue-eyed son. But understand there are three kinds of lies. Understand the anecdotal to be gospel. Take a boy and assign a number to his flesh. Assume the number is his chance of being taken 
world murdered before he reaches manhood. Assume that number is 18. Assume his dad is a 20-sided die. To live, roll an 18 or higher. Assume the wicked of this exercise. Now roll. Now adjust the roll for the variables. Add for American, not black, for American, not brown. Add for not the city I grew up in, and it's downtown, it's buses, it's old E alleys behind liquor stores. Subtract for his art. Subtract for his tender heart. Subtract for velvety, heavy, velvet, hot, velvet, breathless sadness, for sadness for why he feels so sad sometimes. Divide for sex as gender, for who he is told he is by who he is supposed to love, who he might want to love. Divide him by love. Subtract for our anger, our MAGA, our gaslit nostalgia, for what it might mean to be a man in a world frothing toward war. Add for how rich, subtract for how poor. Multiply by privilege, square by systemics, fraction for fentanyl, COVID, for the PM 2.5 pushing to his lungs. Add for no belt, no switch, no father's fist. Add for no pistol in the house. Subtract for lockdown drills, for AR-15s, bump stocks, Columbine copycats. Divide by the NRA, big farmer, bought lots at Yale and Harvard. Take away for the hate you give, the villain you teach. Subtract for the anger of lo angry lost white boys. Subtract for the cruel white boys. Add for saintly boys in makeshift cathedrals. Add for my thick back, my tears, my laugh. Subtract for my bark. Add for Isaac. Subtract for Ishmael. Add for the strength of women. For his mother's love that might be enough all on its own. Take a boy, take all the boys, roll their bones. All right, that was tough. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna switch a little bit into lost boys to powerful women. Um, I'm gonna read this poem, Meg Day. If you don't know Meg Day, she's an amazing poet. I, I often steal ideas from her. Uh, and this, she has a series of poems in her, in her book called On Nights When I Am, you know, Nights When She Is Other People. And these are sort of persona poems that are fun to do. I'm gonna do a couple of these. Uh, but this is a poem. My dad was sick for a long time, um, and I wrote a lot about that, but sometimes you forget the person taking care of the person being sick, the person who can't go home, who can't leave, like, you know, I could leave. So this is me imagining what my mother was like, what it was like for her um, being with him at night and stuff. And it's called, On Nights When I Am My Mother. On nights when I am my mother, I have still not drifted to the center of our California king as I lie awake Wondering if that bellowing belly, those deep brown eyes, that smile on the devil, my husband, who died 10 years ago, after his seven years slow withering, whether he loved me or just the presence of me. The role of me going to marshals to close the kids for school, cutting the lawn or having it cut, meeting with teachers, filling the fridge, especially with ice cream, wanting to be home on Sundays, and I take the boys to Matthew's church as he lay in bed watching Bonanza reruns. I wondered, did I love him? And when I joked to my sons that my first sleepover away from home was my honeymoon, I laughed but sucked back a breath and wonder if that is why I married him. On nights when I am my mother, I could still see him cigarette thin in the face of my football coach father in the soft lit and warm kitchen I grew up in, asking my father for my hand. My father has just said he's not impressed. And the man I will marry says he's not there to impress him. On nights when I am my mother, I hope the boys will bring the kids by, that my oldest will not be so short with me in the same way that the man I married was. On nights when I am my mother, I am sorry that I am a fool to my son who does not know what it feels like to every day to bride a wound that will not heal and a sucking, sunken stomach. On nights when I am my mother, I wonder if I should have made them help me change their father's dressings, clean the blood, pus, shit, and piss from the sheets. No. I do not want to take that much of their father away from them. No, I'm not a fool. They are becoming better fathers than he was perhaps, but on nights when I am my mother, I don't like the way they bark sometimes at their wives. On nights when I am my mother, the broken flesh that is still my husband asks me for more pain medication, and I say yes, and ask for more, and I give him more. So a little extra oxy drips through his J2. On those nights, I remember the way we looked at each other, 
That day we went to the pain management doctor who told him, I don't even know how you were alive. And for the first time, he wept for the long days of hurt still to come. So when the man I married looks at me, says a little more, I love him, and so I do. And when again, paramedics show up to revive him, when our boys arrive, terrified to hold his withered hands, when they leave because they have the luxury to leave, when we are alone again in his sleepless moaning nights, and he says more without saying more, I know that he is my husband, that he loves me, knows me enough to know that I will, that I am, that I am always more. All right. Um, I'm gonna read this poem, two more poems. And this poem, I'm gonna read it because it's related to our, our, our friend Chard. Um, it's a distant rel relative of Hannah Dustin. Hannah Dustin, if you don't know, in sort of a Puritan colonial days, um, was kidnapped by um, some indigenous people taken from her family. Um, one of her children was killed, and in the middle of the night, she got up and mass massacred the, those who were keeping her captive. She actually, um, she scalped them um, in revenge for her daughter's death, and then returned home, and then to Haverhill, where she's from, but then, she, you know, can you understand a mother's anger that might do that? But then she went to Boston and took the bounty out on the, on the scalps. So this little complicated history between, you know, that. And this little thing here from the Smithsonian. Uh, Though all but forgotten today, Hannah Dustin was probably the first American woman to be memorialized on a public monument. The mystery of why Americans come to see patriotic heroism in Dustin's extreme, even gruesome violence, and why she became popular more than 100 years after her death helps explain how the United States sees itself in world conflicts today. The idea of a feminized, always innocent America has been the principle by which the United States has structured many interactions with enemy others, Smithsonian.com. So this isn't her voice, not her voice, but her voice in the statue, because there's a couple statues of her, the first statue of ever built a woman in America. But when I woke in stone, my child was nowhere near, and Merrimack had dragged me back to this atoll, this Bosquin. My right hand holds the hatchet I used in my left the bouquet of flesh I had taken from their heathen heads, it is said my captors taught me how. It is easier for you that they murdered her, my Martha, broke her baby's skull against an apple tree, plucked my nipple from her root. The truth? I recall bare feet on ice, but not the apple tree. I was distraught, though, at least enough for slaughter. And does the ledger still stand in my favor? How do the scalps tally? How many were too many? How many until God becomes our enemy? I was mother. Marbled down with milk in my breast, the child was in me, my blood still staunched by a napkin that night my captors slept too deep. I offered no apology, no justification for their six children. I was mother, I am mother, but no matriarch to your concord of murder. If you need to believe, if you need my maternity, my femininity, my goddess of liberty in your myth of destiny, mouth of country, will you forever let her head explode Feel virtue in the long hair slipping wet through my fingers. Will you question why I collected the bounty? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna read one little bit sweeter. I'm gonna a little sweeter poem. Like, okay, this, I wrote this poem. Again, I like borrowing ideas from poets. Lynn Melnick, another brilliant poem out of New York. She has a poem called 12, looking at her life compared to her, her daughter's life at 12, and I just ripped her off. Um, and wrote one called 13 for my daughter when she turned 13, and she is now uh, 19. So I'm so about to be a sophomore in college. So I'm just gonna read this little prose poem to my daughter at 13, and sort of looking at me at 13, her at 13. She was much better at it. Uh, to my daughter at 13, when I was your age, I loved a girl named Jen, and when she had Becky ask me to come over that blue October afternoon to the house where she was babysitting, and I slammed hard to the street, Bombing down a hill, my skateboard, one kryptonic wheel catching a stone, my elbow all road rash and blood. And when later I sat next to Jen on the couch, I think she expected me to kiss her, but I wasn't sure and didn't know how to be sure, so I played Don't Break the Ice with the kid she was babysitting for. And wasn't I such a gentleman, a good boy, and so terrified of a girl? Delaney, your dolls, your Leia's and Ray's look dusty on your bedroom shelf. 
When I was your age, my G.I. Joe still posed, but I was scared to play with them in case Dad came home muttering, he's weird, to Mom. So when I was your age, I made myself go outside and play football with my brother's friends. When I was your age, I stopped talking to Reggie about the X-Men and the bus, even though the fall of the mutants was upon us. When I was your age, I finally figured out how to punch a boy back hard enough he wouldn't ever hit me again before school on the blacktop as I leaned against the chain-link fence that covered her backs from the knuckles and grabs of older boys. You tell me the cool girls are mean. You say you don't bother with them, but have you ever been in love? Brought to bail fire another's glance. When I was your age, the girl I loved dumped me the night a ball went through Buckner's legs and the Sox would lose a series and she kissed Dave. Is the broken heart still a hurt all over the skin? Is this what you and mom were whispering? You've told me kids you know are kissing. When I was your age, some friends were getting laid, but I just wanted to be seven again and forever in Miss Q's class drawing pictures of Luke and R2. When I was your age, we started sneaking beers because we were supposed to start sneaking beers, but Delaney, be safe. Keep sitting on the den couch with us to argue and angle about what we should watch on a Friday night. Because when I was your age, Friday night was football games, showing off to the girls by getting bloody in games of smear the queer. Because when I was your age, gay was AIDS, and we were all too afraid to say anything but what we thought was the right thing. Ah, oh, poor Reggie on the bus. When I was your age, the only good thing I ever did was stick up for him that one time, and Vula heard me and told him, and he said thank you. But mostly, when I was 13, I was a coward like the rest. While you stand outside your school to protest gun violence, while you drop pictures where every woman is the right kind of beautiful, while you get yourself up in the blue-black dawn for a world you know will come and leave claws, while you laugh with your brother, talk to your mother, while you lean into me and let me give you the hug I didn't even know I needed. Thank you. Thank you very much.